If you ever felt a little bit unsettled by the nomenclature of fail fast or fail forward that some people like to use for introducing Agile into organizations, know that you are not alone. Even though Winston Churchill said, success consists of ongoing from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm, I do like the picture that he paint, but that is very normal that some people do not want to fail. And the wording might be the key here for you to understand. So in this video, what I'm going to be doing is helping you to figure out three ways of reframing this approach so that it's then a useful thing that you can use for yourself and with your teams. Hi, Epitola here. So in this video, we are going to be talking about the three ways of reframing this approach of failing fast or failing forward. And the first one is that consider it's not about failing fast, but about learning fast. What do I mean by that? Well, you could just keep failing, trying and failing, trying and failing and not learning anything. So you have to stop and make time, make space for that learning. Because in the end, you are not going after failure. You're going after learning, learning that this is a good investment so that you can continue or learning that this is a horrible investment and then you can stop investing in it. So there are three things then that I think help in this reframing for learning fast. The first one is at the heart of agile work in small, iterative pieces instead of a guns a blazing two year long project before you can commit that long, you actually want to just keep committing for, um, you know, smaller slices of time and of work. And at the end of those smaller amount of time and work, you then you stop and you reassess the quality, the benefits, the, the results that you are getting. The second thing is that when you talk about failing fast, some people are all about doing, doing, doing. And then now you, you mentioned learning and some people might over rotate and stay here in their heads. So the whole point is actually to balance it out. Remember that any theory and invention, they need to be materialized. So you're encouraging people to think about things, but you have to see if your assumptions are valid in the field and before it, it's too late. And that's the reason why you don't make things too big. And that's why you make things in a way that you can put them in practice early enough so that you can understand and prove or disprove your thoughts. And that leads us to the third piece, which is the understanding that learning will create some sort of adjustment. That means I change something. If I really learn, it's not only happening here, it happens out there. So I want to learn fast enough that something doesn't sell, doesn't work, doesn't please, so that then I can keep trying different things and by successive approximation, I can then discover what is it that sells, that works, that pleases. Like so, you can preserve investment that you have and you can find a threshold within which you can operate with safety and still try and learn new things for the sake of your team and ultimately the whole organization. What I like about this approach is that people procrastinate less and get a bias toward action. So for example, what will prove to you that a two week sprint is really the best for your team? To some extent, there is nothing that you can do but to try, knowing that it's not gonna hurt anybody if later you wanna operate in three or four week sprints, or if you wanna keep the two weeks, but then with adjustments. But you do have to go and try and make space for learning at the end, of the, the end of the iteration and see, did it work, why and how, and what are my next steps to moving forward? So the second reframing I offer you is that it's not about permission to fail, but about permission to succeed. And what I mean by that is that in some spaces, you're gonna hear coaches and other colleagues saying, well, we need to create a safe space for failure. And actually remember once again, that failure here might be the key word of not succeeding. So you can format the whole thing around the experience of success. You can extract learning from failure and you can also extract learning from success. So that might be the avenue that's actually easier with your team or with your organization. You can repeat 
good practices from other places, from other teams, and even a full different organization, so long as they apply to your context and to the parameters that you are operating within. So I myself, for example, I love reading biography of highly successful people and then study their habits and their thinking and even how they turn the ship around in difficult situations. So there are two things here that you can consider. The first being not every idea has merit. So you can and should give yourself a little bit of time to think and do a triage of ideas, either yours or of your team, because not every idea has the same power and could yield the same results. So you can select a couple of them and, and examine those that could presumably yield better results. Don't be random at your experiments, be intentional. The second though is that if it's about learning, be mindful of how many constraints you impose. You want this to be a safe space to learn. So there has to be some freedom and flexibility in there. And that also means that to improve your freedom and flexibility while maximizing chances of success, you want to remove those low grade attempts. So it's really tied to what I just said, and it is using the experiences of others or even your own that seems to be more aligned to give you an opportunity for success. So if there is something that you already know that is called like a low grade attempt or something that's going to give like very minimal result or you have no idea whatsoever what could happen, maybe that's the idea that you do not want to this time around. And what I like about this approach is I find that people get more mindful on how they invest their time. In a world where time is such a critical limited resource, you don't have that much to spend, so spend it wisely. One example here would be learning from places like Booking.com and Google or Amazon. And I know a lot of people say like, well, but we are not like these companies. However, I would like to investigate why would you not learn from someone who already had an opportunity to make many mistakes, especially huge costly mistakes, and move away from that. And those companies, I mean, they are you can deny that they are successful. So I would really, um, you know, I would really consider if you're gonna use Jira or if you're trying to see like should I use Kanban or should we really adopt safe? You know, all those questions that seems to be a little bit more uh, common, they, they have already been answered in some shape or form in through the lenses of those successful teams within your organization as well, or outside, like I mentioned, with big winner organizations. And the third reframing and my favorite one is really that it's not about failure. It really is about results. Consider that results is what you want always. And results is just data. Everything else, failure included, is meaning. And meaning is subjective. What is failure in the eyes of some people is a huge success in the eyes of others. So in the end, you are trying to obtain results and you don't get very attached. You just, you know, you assess those results and consider if they are going in the direction that you want satisfactory enough. And in which case you're going to make a decision to continue your pursuit. And if they are going in a different direction, you then are going to adjust something or maybe completely stop what you're doing and change direction entirely. So in this reframing, what you do as an agile coach is really help people understand that in the end, everybody is getting results. Nobody is failing or the opposite. Everybody is getting results. And you know, some results might be super positively proportional to your investment in the project and others might not. So that really detaches from our emotions and help us get a little bit more clear on what is really important and getting more methodical in assessing the results that we are getting. And what I really, really like about this perspective is that it helps people get a lot less frustrated and a lot more objective. So for this one, I'm going to give you an example that has nothing to do with Agile specifically. Consider that someone this month made $2,000 in revenue and through your eyes right now, comparing to your salary, you might look like, wow, that is really not much. You just assigned meaning to those results. However, Consider that if this person made just less than $1,000 last month, if you look at proportions, percentage, and ratio, look what happened. That person now in just the span of a month just made over 100% improvement in their revenue. So I really do consider you to invite people to notice ratios and percentage and those things they are a lot more telling. Sometimes the absolutes are really not that great 
on their own, but you can detect the trends. You can plot those things in the chart and really see the movement forward or otherwise that is being made. And then you have a very objective cause for making a well-informed decision. So there you have it, three ways of reframing this approach of failing fast or failing forward that you and many people don't feel comfortable of using, at least not with that language around it. So I hope this reframing that I offer you, those three types, they kind of give you a few avenues to explore within your organization and help people to use the approach no matter what it's called. I hope this video was useful. Let me know if there was like a favorite one, a favorite way of reframing that you found more interesting. I'd love to know. And if you have any questions, let me know as well. As for now, I'll stop the video here and I'll catch you on the next one. Bye.